It's hard to believe that our peak gardening season has come to an end, plant friends. And for those of us living in climates where we experience fall and winter, it is so hard to believe that our peak gardening season has come to a close. Man, I feel like I blinked and the summer was gone and now it's time to align with the seasons, wind down and prep for a little dormancy, maybe for ourselves, but mostly for our gardens. And while we do this and prepare to go into cozy season, we need to set our gardens up to get cozy and rest as well. That's why today I'm speaking with gardening expert and my new plant friend, Raish Gala, about all the things that we need to know about winding our garden down for the winter, giving the soil a little bit of love, setting the garden up for success next year after the snow melts, and just generally prepping for winter break. Plus, Raish is genuinely one of the most delightful plant ladies I have met lately. I'm so excited to introduce you to her. So welcome to this cozy and fun episode. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hi, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Gosh darn it. I can't believe it's November. What the heck? What the heck? It's like the garden went in a blink of an eye. You'll hear me talk about this a little bit more this in my episode with Race today, but I really do feel like I kind of didn't get a gardening season this year, the summer, as we know, I was diagnosed with melanoma. I had surgery in July. I had such a curveball thrown at me this summer where I really wasn't able to accomplish a lot of the gardening things that I wanted to get done, but that's okay. I'm taking it in stride and I still had a beautiful garden. I still had a wonderful gardening season. I still harvested a lot of cherry tomatoes, a lot of herbs. And I love that in this episode, Raish, our guest today, will walk you through All of the steps, step by step, what you need to do to kind of wind your garden down for the winter in prep for the snowfall and how to set your soil up for success so that when it melts, you're going to have epic, amazing, nutrient dense soil for your next garden. But the end of the episode ends up really kind of turning into two plant friends talking about, you know, what went well and what didn't go well in their gardens this year and planning for next year. So this was a lovely episode. I'm so excited to air it for you. And I'm so excited to make this new plant friend in race. She's so awesome. I can't believe I hadn't met her before. Speaking of plant friends, I wanted to give a shout out to a few new plant friends of our garden society. Viva A, Tanya R, and Madeline S. Welcome, plant friends. Welcome, ladies. So excited to have you as part of our Garden Society community. For those of you listening that don't know, the Garden Society, the Growing Joy Garden Society, is my private online platform. It's a private community that's algorithm and troll free. You can access it via iOS or Android app or your computer. It is the kindest and planniest corner of the internet filled with amazing plant friends and tutorials for you. We released a flower crown tutorial in September, a plant magic tutorial in October and November. We are doing a Kokodama workshop, which you'll hear about more in next week's episode. And I'm just trying to fill that community filled with so many amazing planty resources for you. Plus, it's an amazing way to make new plant friends close to you or internationally because we have a beautiful international community. Plus, a year membership makes a great gift for the holidays. The holidays are coming up. And uh, if you have a plant friend that you need to get a gift for, a year membership to the Garden Society is super affordable, makes a great gift, or maybe it's something you ask for for yourself. So anyway, welcome, ladies. So happy to get to know you in the Garden Society platform. All right. We got to get into this amazing episode. Raish is such an incredible educator and we had such a fun conversation. She was so easy to talk to and gives amazing actionable steps that at the end of this episode, you will be able to execute to make sure that you set your soil up for success next year and set your local wildlife up for success to enjoy the fruits of your bounty in the winter, which you will understand more as we dive into the episode. So without further ado, here's Raish. Raish, welcome to Growing Joy. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Maria. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So, you know, it's a big time for us gardeners who experience winter. Our gardens are going to sleep. We've probably, by the time this episode comes out, maybe even experienced our first frost. 
And I think it's important as we gear up to, you know, in the spring, we prepare for our gardens and now it's time to let them go to bed. I'm so excited to chat with you about this, but you're such an amazing gardener. Before we dive in, do you want to just share a brief introduction to who you are and how you became the amazing gardening guru that you are today? Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm just one of the many ordinary gardeners started off, you know, just dabbling in gardening. I didn't have any experience, no kind of degree in horticulture, agriculture, none of that stuff. So I'm your everyday gardener, basically. And, you know, in life, I guess a lot of times we learn from our mistakes. And so that's sort of how my journey in gardening began with the failure to grow two tomato plants that I had picked up from a big box retailer. I didn't know anything about gardening, put it on the patio, did not transplant them into a bigger container or into the garden and completely failed miserably. And I was like, how can a girl from Jersey not be able to grow Jersey tomatoes? So (laughs) it was one of those moments I was like, how could this be possible? Because everybody you see is able to grow tomatoes and zucchini and cucumbers. And not just that, but when you go to the grocery store, you see such an abundance of food. So how could it be so hard to grow food when it's so easy to eat it, right? And it's so easily available for us, at least. So that's where my journey began with the failure to grow tomatoes. And so the next year, I hired a landscaper and got some, you know, small raised beds built in my backyard and thinking, okay, this is going to help change everything. And unfortunately, the soil that he had put in was like the worst quality construction type of a soil, you know. And so I had all the pests and diseases come in and wreak havoc in my garden. And so that was a learning experience as well. So I quickly realized upon doing some research and not giving up, basically being persistent. And I realized that, you know, the crucial part of any gardening success is really it starts with the soil and starts with good soil. That's the foundation. So I took out all the poor quality construction soil with rocks and stones in them. And I filled my beds with the best soil. And after that, I slowly started seeing more and more success. And here I am today, growing a lot of food, inspiring others and um, on your podcast as well. (laughs) What does your current garden look like? How many beds do you have? What are you growing? How many seasons do you grow in? So I currently have about six raised beds in my backyard. And I I consider myself a small space gardener. I just have, between the measurements of the raised beds, I have only 84 square feet of growing space, which Mm. is not much given, you know, lots of people have acres and acres of land. And many people are transitioning now into homesteading and things like that. So I'm, I consider myself just a small space backyard gardener. And majority of the people actually, that's manageable to them you know, having a small garden instead of, you know, a big space that they don't know what to do with. That's what I have, a few raised beds. And I grow through all the growing seasons. I know typically the books tell you or, you know, people say that you can grow only between your last frost date and your first frost date, which is, you know, for us, I'm in New Jersey and you know this as well, right? So limited. And so that's just like, I try to, instead of five months between May and October, I try to double my growing season and grow at least 10 months of the year. So I'm harvesting things like lettuce, spinach, kale, uh, bok choy, beets, carrots in like December during Christmas, in January, and sometimes even February with two feet of snow. And uh, that's a thrill because, you know, you want to always see push the limits of what you can grow and see what is really possible, what the potential is of your garden. But at the same time, as much as I encourage people to, you know, grow in fall and winter, which I believe is the best time to grow food because you have less pest pressure and things like that, without any judgment, it's totally fine if you're burnt out and you feel tired and you need rest as a human being the garden needs to rest as well. And that's totally acceptable. And it's actually a good thing too. Yeah. How are you doing that with two feet of snow? Do you have covers on your garden, like cold frames for those boxes? Or or how are you doing that? So I don't have cold frames for my raised beds. But instead, what I do have is I bent hoops, you know, the metal conduit pipes that you get at Home Depot, Lowe's and everywhere. 
you just pick up, uh, you know, those 10 foot long pipes, you have a hoop bender, and then I bend them and then just stick them in. So I don't use any fancy equipment. I just use my bent hoops. And if you don't uh, know how to bend hoops, you can get a PVC pipe too. That's okay. And you just, you know, stick them and push them in into your race beds. So for example, if I have a four foot by four foot race bed, I would put in three hoops and then cover it with six mil farm grade plastic, you know. And uh, research says that, and so what happens is it kind of creates a terrarium effect or a greenhouse effect where everything inside stays warm and toasty and thrives well. And when the plants transpire, they hit the cold plastic, the water vapor hits the cold plastic and falls back down as rain. And the process keeps going. So you don't really need to water much. It's like autopilot gardening pretty much. So it's wonderful to experience that, you know, even when there's snow outside. I'm assuming you have like a blog or something about this on your website that maybe we could include in the show notes for people who are interested. Sure, I think I do. And plus, I have a lot of videos on extending your growing season on my Instagram, a lot of reels. So I'll definitely um, send you a couple of links to those as well. Yeah, we can put them in the show notes because I feel like that could be an episode in itself. Grow (laughs) carrots under snow. I mean, that's a whole different thing. That's amazing. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. So for those of us who are tired or who, you know, don't want to bend the hoops and are really comfortable just growing in between the frosts and experience four seasons, we were prepping for fall, we're prepping for winter. Why is it important for us to even think about putting our gardens to bed. I'm trying to think about the better, (laughs) a better phrase for this, but it really is. It's like we're putting them to bed so that they can go dormant for the winter and then wake up again in the spring. So why is this important? So I think it's just like us human beings, sometimes after a day long of hard work or after, you know, pushing our body through a lot of exercise, you know, you do need rest. And you do need to uh, have that period of a break where you can rejuvenate yourself. I think the same thing goes even for the garden, because think about it in spring, in summer, during your growing season, so to speak, the garden is constantly giving and giving and giving to you. Right. And so it needs a period of rest where it can rejuvenate itself where it can refresh itself and come back to you stronger and better and healthier. So as a gardener, if you follow that natural rhythm and cycle of nature, where you get to rest, you're tired, you know, working so hard, and you come back in spring with a stronger, healthier soil, I mean, isn't that wonderful? But there are a couple of things that you can do before you, you know, you put your garden to bed, to sleep, so to speak. There are a few things that you must do in order for the soil and for your garden to come back stronger in spring. So we could definitely discuss that. Yeah. So it's the equivalent of like, you know, giving your baby a nice bath and putting or if you take like a nice bath and rub some nice oils on your body, you know, moisturize before it's like a skincare routine before you go to bed or something. Now, I know also a lot of gardeners kind of argue about how much you should do to your garden before the winter because of the sustainability element and the, you know, environmental element of dead plants being important for animals. Can you kind of speak to the sustainable aspect that we should think about with putting our garden to bed as well? Absolutely. Our garden, if you're not planning to grow any food in fall and winter months after your, you know, first frost comes in, then there are a few things that you can do in order to be conscious of the wildlife and the environment and to be sustainable. So one of the things is that if you leave flowering plants, you know, especially you might have seen parsley, cilantro, dill, and so many herbs, they go to flower and they have those seeds on them. So if you leave those in the garden, don't cut them off. What happens is it provides a source of food for the wildlife, for the birds to feed on in the winter months. So that's important. And then the other thing is also, you don't want to cut back your plants and pull them out by the roots. You want to, you know, if you are planning to clean your beds up, which I do recommend you do, so that there isn't any, you know, uh, harboring of disease as such. Even if you do take out your tomato plants, your spent cucumber plants, things like that from the summer, cut them off at the soil level, don't yank them off by the roots. Because what happens is when you leave those roots intact under the soil over the winter months, they do break down and they do provide a source of nutrition and food for the soil microbiology 
the earthworms that are living there to kind of, you know, feed. And then you do know that with earthworms and other soil microbes, you know, when they do feed on that, their worm castings, things like that are a source of food for your plants in spring. So it kind of rejuvenates the soil. It's a whole cycle. So I would say when you are thinking about sustainability, number one, make sure that you do leave your flowering plants, even if your kale has flowered through the summer, things like that, leave it intact. Anything that's diseased, of course, you want to throw it out. Whatever you can, you must compost if it's possible. If you are practicing uh, composting, that's important too. And then um, just be conscious of the environment. Sometimes, you know, we use uh, plastic plant tags, things like that, right? To write the names of our vegetables and fruits. So make sure you're conscious about the environment. Uh, Take out those plant tags. Don't let them be there because if you have wildlife such as rabbit or deer or any other animals coming in, you don't want them to, you know, accidentally ingest those. So over those few winter months when the animals are seeking out food, make sure you take out the plastic tags, do compost whatever you can. And then, of course, the other thing is in order to insulate your soil, a lot of people do use things like straw to cover the soil in order to, you know, have it warm up faster in spring. Just use natural resources, avoid using things like plastic, you know, if that's possible. Okay, I like that. And also, I mean, if you're covering with straw or your leaf piles or your dead plants, like you could cut them off at the roots and then just lay them on top of the bed. That also, that straw could decompose. Like that's just giving more nutrients. Because if you think about it, the soil's tired. After growing these heavy feeders like tomatoes, exactly. eggplants, and cucumbers, the soil is so depleted. All of its nutrients have been sucked up and absorbed by the plants. So however you can amend the soil, I guess, before the winter even starts to allow for extra decomposition before the spring probably makes a lot of sense. What about compost? Do you recommend doing like a layer of compost on top of the soil before the winter so that compost can kind of get in there as well? Oh, 100%. That So I would say anytime you're trying to put your garden to bed, there are a couple of steps that I follow. Step one that I do is usually discard anything that's diseased and dying, especially the debris that's there because then it can harbor germs and, you know, bacteria and things like that. And especially blight, you know, when you're talking about tomatoes. So do clean up. Number one, the step one would be to discard anything that's diseased and clean up, compost, whatever you can. And then once, you know, you clean up your beds and remove whatever you need to remove, the plant material, you must, must, that's the one thing is you must add compost back onto the soil. Because what it does is, That is the thing that it further breaks down over the winter months and provides a source of food to the earthworms. Like I was saying, creates a better soil, a healthier soil when you you want to plant in spring. And what I like to do is each year, I know if you have homemade compost, do that. If you don't have access to compost, just use things like, you know, dried leaves, which are in abundance in fall, for example, you know, or use uh, grass clippings as long as nothing has been sprayed on it. You know, you can cover your soil that way but you just want to add those nutrients back into the soil. So compost, grass clippings, and I like to change up and use different types of compost each year because, you know, like they they tell us as human beings, you should eat the rainbow, right? So it's the same thing when it comes to the garden. Don't just do the same compost every year to your uh, beds. One year I would use homemade compost. Another year, I would use mushroom compost. A third year, I would use like leaf mulch or leaf compost. So each of these ingredients, you know, they add a different element of nutrients back into the soil. And overall, your garden is just healthier because it creates that balance, you know. So yes, definitely compost and add about at least two to three inches on top. Don't mix it in, just lay it on top and then let it seep over the winter months and, you know, makes it easier for you. Your job is easier in spring. So then in the spring, as the snow melts and the plants wake back up, that's when you're mixing. Then you'll give the soil a mix to kind of work the compost in. So the compost usually would have blended in. When you come back in spring, the compost would have blended in with the soil because between the snow and the rain and everything, it would already, the nutrients would have seeped into the soil. So what I would do in spring when I come back, because we've added that compost, the soil you're not going to plant directly in compost. So you would just kind of, you know, zhuzh up the top, you know, four to six inches of soil just to make it loose and comfortable for planting. But the time for planting is when the soil is not frozen, you know. So 
the moment the soil is workable, so to speak, that's when you can bring in the plants and the seeds and start planting in it. So in spring, if you know what I would do is add a little bit more compost and nutrients, sprinkle in some you know all-purpose granular fertilizer just to boost the nutrients further in the soil, and then you know create the perfect planting you know area for my plants. Thank you, Espoma Organic, for sponsoring today's episode, Plant Friends. We talk a lot about compost in today's episode. You got to put compost on top of your garden bed to help reinstate the nutrients in your garden beds over the winter. And Espoma Organics makes two amazing composts. If you don't know, Espoma Organic is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicating to making safe indoor-outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet with their amazing lines of potting soils, fertilizers, and composts. So I loved in today's episode how Raish mentioned that she uses different composts in different years in her garden in order to support her garden beds with the most diverse amount of nutrients coming from the different types of composts. Well, you can do this with Espoma's compost. They have two different composts. Both will support your garden beds impeccably, but they both have some different additives to them. I've used both in my garden beds for years and love them. So the first one is Espoma's Mushroom Compost Blend. Raish talks about how she's using mushroom compost this year. It's the ultimate compost mix to use for planting vegetables, flowers, trees, and shrubs. It combines rich mushroom compost with aged forage products to make the perfect soil conditioner. And then Espoma also has their Land and Sea Compost, which contains a rich blend of the finest natural ingredients and is enhanced with crab and lobster shells from the sea, along with Mycotone, their proprietary blend of mycorrhizae to help bring strong roots and better plants. So you're getting mushrooms, you're getting mycorrhizae and lobster and crab shells. That's a whole lot of nutrients. Both composts are safe for people, pets, and the planet and are 100% natural and organic approved. To learn more about all of Espoma Organics indoor and outdoor products for your gardens and houseplants, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Growing Joy Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites. Holiday shopping is here, plant friends, and what better gift to give someone you love than a personalized Wind River wind chime? Plus, you don't need to leave the house while you shop. Wind River Chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, personalized gift straight to your door. When you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout with them at windriverchimes.com, you can get a free engraving on any of the engravable wind chimes so you can personalize it for your loved one with a special saying, a memorable date, or a name. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering high-quality wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, Restful environment. We have two of them at our house. We are obsessed with them. Mama Fiella recently visited my house to take care of me after my surgery. She would not stop talking about the chime. And when she left, specifically requested one for Christmas for her house in Florida because she could not get over how amazing it sounded versus the other chimes that she already has. And hey, the holidays are stressful and Wind River chimes are really relaxing to listen to. So maybe you get one as a gift or maybe you just get one for yourself. A Wind River chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they're going to think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. Use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com. Get a free engraving on any of the engravable chimes. That's windriverchimes.com and code GROWINGJOY at checkout for your free engraving. Love it. So we have kind of already gotten into it. So when we discussed the steps of putting your garden to bed, you said, clean it up, remove pests and disease, add compost. What other steps do we need to be looking at? So a couple of things when you're talking about putting your garden to bed. One is, of course, particularly related to the garden, which is, you know, the compost and the nutrients. Another thing is, of course, you can add straw, like you were mentioning as well, just to cover up the soil. And what I also like to do is make sure that you have your uh, hose pipe and your irrigation system turned off. You know, those are important things when you're thinking of putting the garden to bed, because as a gardener, you don't want your pipes to, you know, break and crack because something has frozen, right? The water has frozen. So make sure you do steps like that. Clean up your tools as well, right? So it's sort of like the whole putting your garden to bed. One part is the garden with the compost and the cleanup. 
And then the other part is also the wheels and the mechanics of things, such as your watering and your tools to make sure everything is clean and healthy so that in spring you feel excited and, you know, ready to go back into the garden. And you don't feel like, oh, my gosh, it's so overwhelming. I have to now sit and, you know, clean everything or my pipes are broken. I have to go buy something new. So it's important to do things like that as well, which is, you know, to winterize your uh, garden. And uh, apart from that, what I would also recommend, apart from the compost, is you can also try and add cover crops. I don't know if you've heard of that. Have you heard of cover crops before? I've been hearing about them more. So I would love for you to describe what they are and what their purpose is, because I know with regenerative gardening, this is a very popular topic right now. So cover crops, basically, they provide, like we were discussing, they provide a source of food for the animals as well. But what you would do is you would plant those perhaps in late summer, early fall, so to speak, in your garden and just direct sow. And so some of the great cover crops are like peas, oats. There's something called hairy vetch, which is like V-E-T-C-H. And there's so many more. But what happens is like peas especially, which are one of my favorites, and so are oats, they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and add it back into the soil. And as you know, some of the fruiting plants like tomatoes and cucumbers, they love a nitrogen rich soil. So what you would do is grow those and just randomly broadcast sprinkle, which is just basically throw the seeds in the soil, cover it up with a little bit more soil, let it grow. And um, once it grows a couple of inches tall, you can just chop and drop which is cut them and let them lie flat while the roots inside provide the nitrogen, the green masses on top kind of insulate the soil. So it's like a two-in-one, so to speak. So cover crops are excellent. So if I want to plant cover crops, I'm not doing that in November. Are you planting those cover crops in the summer so that they can grow to those four inches and then you're chopping the top, chop and dropping them in October, November, like what's the timing of the cover crops? So ideally, because my frost date is October 15th, I would Mm -hmm. plant the cover crops about middle of August or so, about two months before. Two months before your first frost comes in, plant in the seeds. And when you're planting cover crops, if you, you know, if you're really tired from gardening and you're saying, you know, Raish, I don't have time to even add the compost. I'm just exhausted. That's fine. Don't do that. Then just throw in those cover crops. Just sprinkle those seeds in Mm -hmm. and let it grow. And then what happens in by October or so, it's grown quite a bit. Chop them up, you know, let them just drop on your raised Mm -hmm. bed, on your soil and let it just do its thing. And that's it. Under the soil, there's this work going on. About the soil, there's work going on. So it's fantastic. I love that. What are you personally doing for your garden this fall? So this year, for sure, I'm going to be adding oats as my cover crop. So what I do is, even though I have these six raised beds, I don't grow in all the six raised beds. I would grow maybe in four of them, while two of them, I just let rejuvenate and relax and I put them to bed. So I'll be adding cover crops in a couple of my raised beds, which are oats. I got just a five pound bag. Uh, recently. So I've added oats to my raised beds. And then for some of the other ones, I will definitely be adding compost. So I have two composters at home. So I'm going to be adding my homemade compost. And I will also be adding mushroom compost this year because last year I added the leaf mold, leaf compost. So this year I'm like, okay, I'm going to do the mushroom compost just to zhuzh things up, you know, and change it up a little bit. I love that cycling. That's smart. Yeah, I I think and we should all, right? Variety is the spice of life. They say all these things. So might as well add that variety to the garden as well. And what I do is I definitely like to grow, even if you're tired and you don't want to grow anything at all, I still recommend planting garlic if it's possible. Oh, yeah. Do you do that? (laughs) I haven't, but I did a garlic episode this year with Jill Winger. And she got me so inspired. And I know you and I both work with Territorial Seed Company and they're the garlic goats, right? They're, they've got all the good garlic. So they've inspired me to try growing. I'm a grow bag gardener and we're probably moving by the time next spring rolls around. So I'm going to try. I'm going to plant a grow bag with a bunch of garlic and say a prayer. And if we move <laughs> and we're likely probably moving gardening zones as well, we're just going to see how it goes. We're just going to see if it works. But I've been 
been very fascinated by garlic. And I find when I interview gardeners and I ask what their favorite plants are to grow, it is consistently garlic. Like the gardeners, yeah. true <laughs> gardeners grow garlic, I feel like. So, you know, if I want to become a true gardener, I guess I have to grow garlic too. So what about <laughs> yeah, you? Do you grow it? I grow it all the time. And usually I like to grow each year. It, You know, my um, garlic pile grows bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. Because it's truly, it's so easy to grow. You don't have to worry about watering it. You don't have to worry that it's out, you know, getting snowed upon and things like that. It just, it's so resilient and it's easy to grow. And it's it makes also such a great companion plant. Of uh, Few people realize that, but if you plant garlic and if you don't want to do a whole bed of garlic, just do it around the borders of your raised bed. So you still have space because, you know, garlic takes about nine months or so to grow. Plant it around the borders of, you know, your raised bed if you have that. Or like you're saying, growbacks are fantastic as well. It's also an amazing pest deterrent. So exactly. I've done pest episodes before and our pest expert said plant garlic in the outside of your garden because those pests or animals that burrow, when they hit the garlic, they're not going to like the smell of it. And so they'll stop burrowing. Exactly. So uh, that's why uh, for a lot of my clients, what I do is I do recommend that they plant garlic around the borders of their raised beds, because like you said, it's a fantastic pest deterrent. And so the nematodes and aphids and things like that, you'll notice that they attack your main crop far less if they're surrounded by, uh, you know, garlic. I like to think of things that you can do, do one thing that can give, you know, a double impact, so to speak, like cover crops, for example, or garlic as well. You know, it's easy to grow in winter and, you know, it's a pest deterrent. And so with garlic, what I do, like we were talking about putting the garden to bed, usually in right before, you know, after planting garlic, when the greens start popping out about the ground, And they stay up there about one to two inches tall that they just start coming out in um, fall. I take my mushroom compost and I mulch around the garlic because then, you know, with the snow and the rain, it seeps down in and provides, you know, nutrients for your garlic plant. So you'll have like massively big bulbs if you just do that one trick, which is mulch with compost. So smart. So smart. I love that. The other thing I think it's important with putting your garlic to bed, you know, I'm a self-care, plant care gal. I think it's such an important opportunity to reflect on the gardening season. I think the experience of a lot of gardeners I've talked to is they're out of their minds come March because they're so itchy to get out in their garden. Everyone overdoes it. You plant up your garden. You have this amazing or not so amazing growing season. And come September, October, you're burned yeah. out. Your yeah. garden is full of weeds. You're tired. <laughs> you're, you know, you're overrun. So I think some people skip this step, but I think it's so important to just take a minute, reflect on what the gardening season has has been like, reflect on how different this season was than last season. I'm sure you're in the same boat as me, but personally, I am shocked at how I did not water my garden once this year because of how much rain we got. I mean, I didn't water it once when last year I was watering it once or twice a day in August because of how hot it was. So reflecting on that, reflecting on what worked, what didn't, I know personally, like I got into herbalism. So I started growing plants and drying them for the first time. I was watching, you have a great reel on your Instagram about dehydrating cherry tomatoes, which I'm totally stealing and doing myself. But I think it's a great time to reflect. So what do you reflect on at the end of the gardening season in preparation, I guess, for the next gardening season? So I think one of the things that I do reflect on is I like to make a list of the things that were my favorites and what worked Mm. and what didn't. So I always like to, you know, grow some of my tried and true tested varieties, which are my, you know, favorites. But then every season, every year, I like to grow something different, something new. And one of the things that I like to reflect on is, did this thing work? Is this going to make it to my favorites list? What's on your favorites list (laughs) from this past summer? Listen, so I'm a big uh, tomato girl. Me too. I love tomatoes. And I'm always, even though I love so many varieties. I'm always looking for that new best variety. So I love growing Midnight Roma tomatoes. I don't know if you've tried those. They're like a blackish purple Roma tomato and just absolutely delicious. And they look like jewels in the garden, literally, like it should be on a tiara or something. Beautiful and really delicious. So those were a big hit this year for me. 
I grew a cucumber variety this year for the first time called Sikkim Cucumber, which looked like a coconut from the outside. It had this, you know, brown crackled patina. Yeah, what? exactly. Yeah. But it had zero bitterness. It was so crunchy like an apple. And that was like, wow, that was cool. I would like to grow that again, something new and different. So, you know, I'm always looking for those. And my most favorite tomato varieties are the Cherokee Purple and Aunt Ruby's. You know, that's an absolute favorite of mine. Aunt Ruby's um, German Green Tomato. Yum. What about yours? Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, I got skin cancer in the middle of the summer. Oh so I had, I'm okay. I'm cancer free I'm now. Okay. Yeah, I'm cancer free. Thank God. But July, I got surgery in July and I got diagnosed in June. So I had all these plans for my garden that just didn't happen, frankly, because I was totally focused elsewhere. I had to commute into the city a lot for doctor's appointments. So I would say I had a, a prolific tomato harvest, but I would say I didn't accomplish a lot of the things that I wanted to accomplish in the garden, but I'm completely okay with it because, you know, life took a turn and you got to flex. And frankly, I learned what's the hardy stuff because really it was only the hardy stuff that made it through. But I feel like my garden was very forgiving with me because I grew calendula for the first time this year. I loved that flower because that's a big herbalism flower. I want, I've been growing the calendula and then harvesting and drying it. And I'm my plan is to make a calendula chamomile body butter. Wow. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So I've had a couple of herbalist interviews on this podcast. Amazing women. Juliet Blankenspore is an amazing herbalist. And she has this amazing book that I've read multiple times. And so I'm going to use her recipe for that. So I feel like my kind of approach to why I'm growing stuff kind of changed this year because I'm like, okay, how can I use this almost medicinally in a capacity? So calendula was great and it was amazing for pollinators. I grew, it was an orange variety and man, the bees and the pollinators were all over it. So I felt like that was a great companion plant for my tomatoes. And then this year we always grow one like Roma sauce style tomato that we freeze and then cook with all, all winter but we don't eat during the summer. Ironically, we like save it for the winter for sauces. And then I only do cherry tomatoes because I want the immediate, like I just want to pick a couple cherry tomatoes every day for our salads. And this year we tried a bunch of different cherry tomatoes. There were a few that we didn't care for, but the Lizano cherry tomato was amazing. So prolific. And I got to say, Sun Gold, man, Sun Gold is a tried and true, like everybody's favorite. It's everybody's favorite for a reason. It was so good. I also had an interesting experience that two summers ago, I grew the blush variety of cherry tomato. Have you ever grown that one? I have not. Blush. It is tie dye. It is the coolest wow. tomato. I talk about it all the time on this podcast. Okay, I'm going to make notes right now. <laughs> yes, you must try it. It's tie dye yellow and red. It is so cool and it's delicious. It's so sweet. I grew it a couple years ago. Prolific. This year, I shaded it accidentally. And so I'm getting like two tomatoes off of it. So that was interesting. But I learned, you know, I always put nasturtium in my garden because I love the way it looks. It looks like a, a very popular house plant, pepper, uh, the Pilea peperomioides. But what I found this year is it just shades out my grow bag so poorly and I don't eat the leaves and I do eat the edible flowers and the flowers are great pollinators, but I feel like I'm not getting the bang for the buck out of nasturtium that I want to. Like, I think I should just use it as a decorative plant. So I'm thinking that I've grown it for three summers now. I think I might let that go next year. And then I just want to grow herbs. I love my herb garden. And then I grew a great cucumber, actually indoors in my hydroponic planter, but it was the most prolific mini cucumbers called Quick Snack. Oh. Have you tried that variety? It's that territorial seed. I have not. I usually do homemade cucumber variety, the homemade pickles. Oh, okay. Okay. Quick so good. Snack. So I'm definitely going to take a look at that. Thank we, you. <laughs> I feel like I am in a cloud 
right now, plant friends. Do you know why I feel like I'm in a cloud? It's because I am wrapped in the cozy embrace of a cashmere outfit from one of my new favorite clothing brands, Quince. I have been wanting to hit reset lately, plant friends, especially with my daily work from home attire. I went through my work from home in your pajamas era, and now I want to enter my work from home in your cute, cozy, comfortable outfits era. And this is when I found Quince because they are so fairly priced and the quality of their clothes and their home goods is insane. Like I said, I am wearing their Mongolian cashmere sweater right now and it feels like I am wrapped in the coziest cloud and they also make throw blankets with this Mongolian cashmere. Let me describe my outfit to you. I feel so comfortable and elegant at the same time. So I, like I said, I'm wearing one of their Mongolian cashmere sweaters. Plant Friends, they're priced at $50. A cashmere sweater for $50. Oh my gosh, it is so comfortable. It is so breathable and it comes in so so many colors. I'm wearing the burgundy one, but I also have my eye on their spicy mustard one and their Everglade green one because obviously I need to match my plants. I'm also rocking their ultra soft bike shorts. And let me tell you something about these shorts. They feel like butter. All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the saving on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. So give your closet and your home the refresh it deserves with Quince. Go to quince.com slash joy to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince, Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash joy for free free shipping, and 365-day returns, quince.com slash joy. I'm Dr. Laurie Santos, host of the Happiness Lab podcast. Making new friends and maintaining old friendships is a great way to boost your happiness. There are lots of sources of well-being standing around you. You just have to tap into them. But sadly, we don't always feel up for being sociable. If I was approaching a stranger, my heart would race. I'd feel like I was going to throw up. I just had so much anxiety around it. So in a new season of the show, I'll tackle how to make firm friendships firmer, right through to the joy you can find in talking to total strangers. I'm very much enjoying your animal print scarf, madam. You look wonderful. The steps to becoming more social might surprise you. But trust me, there are things you can introduce into your daily routine right away. I adore your purple hair, madam. It pops. So listen to The Happiness Lab on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Fall is here, winter is coming, which always makes me want to do a little refresh, a little reset, get cozy, especially when it comes to my home, when it kind of feels like I'm prepping to hibernate up here in the woods of New York. Um, But cozy, luxe, home good items can be expensive. That's when I discovered that Quince, the company that I've been loving for their affordable and luxe clothing, also has well-priced home goods that elevate my home. So you've heard me talk about the gorgeous Mongolian cashmere sweater that I have been living in. It feels like I am wrapped in a cloud. But Quince also has the Mongolian cashmere throw blankets and pillow covers. Could you imagine a Mongolian cashmere throw blanket wrapped around you as you binge Gilmore Girls or whatever other show you watch in the winter? Plus, they have luxury quality home goods like their European linen and luxury organic sateen sheet sets. And like Quince's clothing, their home goods are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. You heard me right, 50 to 80% less. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices along with premium fabrics and finishes. When I tell you I live in the biker shorts and cashmere sweater that I have from theirs, I mean, I, I wear them too often than I should admit. Give your home the refresh it deserves with Quince. Go to quince.com slash joy to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince spelled Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash joy for free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash joy. Yeah, we like the mini cucumbers because you can dice one up for a salad. Like they're the perfect kind of serving size. So I grew the quick snack. I think it's called like Q4 quick snack or something. It was on Territorial site. I grew it from seed in my hydroponic planter. One pod of a plant yielded 30 mini cucumbers. It was insane. Oh my God, that's crazy. It was 
so prolific. So that I'm going to grow forever and ever and ever. And then I'm getting more and more into flowers. So I'm, uh, I used to only grow edibles and now I'm like a flower mama. So I'm always experimenting with flowers. Last year I got into dahlias. This year I did more zinnias. I just love zinnias. What flowers do you like to grow for your pollinators in your garden? You know, when my gardening journey started, it was just this green patch and it was all like the veggies. And now I have, you know, with flowers, it adds more color and beauty. And it just gives you so much joy when you walk into the garden. It just makes you happy. So I have started each year. I feel like I'm adding just like you more herbs, more flowers into the garden. So every year I definitely do zinnias and the queen lime red zinnia is like one of my Mm -hmm. favorites. And then Mm -hmm. in um, fall as well, what I do is around the same time that I'm planting garlic, I would plant tulips as well and La Belle Epoch. Beautiful. Have you heard of that variety? Yeah. It's this blushing vintage pink kind of color. It's just gorgeous. So I grow tulips and then I also plant saffron, which has a beautiful purple crocus, you know, so I do that. And uh, in spring and in fall, I do a lot of edible flowers and violas pansies which are beautiful I love violas exactly my daughter loves to bake and so she adds that to all her creations they're so pretty and like you were saying about nasturtiums with violas they don't you know take over your garden right yes so they're kind of cute so I do violas and of course I do calendula as well and then this year a cosmos is another one of my favorites so pretty you know (gasps) I didn't grow Cosmos this year and I missed them. I had epic Cosmos last year and I couldn't find any this year. And I I didn't start from seed this year and uh, I regret it. So I'm definitely going back to Cosmos. Cosmos are the most ethereal, magical plant. They're just incredible. 100%. They're incredible. And I I feel a lot of people don't know that they're edible as well. You know, the Cosmos, the flowers. Yeah, so um, they just look pretty. They add some, you know, whimsy to the garden because they're delicate as well. So I grew those also this year and dahlias as well, you know. So those are kind of the ones that I've grown. And yes, just like you, this year I was like, I want to grow more medicinal plants and herbs. So I did do some aloe vera in my garden, eucalyptus, which was amazing. (gasps) Uh, Have you, you must grow eucalyptus. You can turn. I haven't because eucalyptus typically is a tree, but if you grow the um, the smaller version of the eucalyptus, I believe it's called the baby blue or the silver dollar. You can use those. The leaves are so fragrant and scented. Steep them in some carrier oil, like olive oil or whatever you like. Steep them in that for you know at least a month or so, and then use that oil to massage your body in winter or your joints, you know, if you have achy things after a a workout. And then, you know, it is just heavenly. I mean, the smell is amazing. Oh my gosh. And you see all those aesthetic Instagram girlies (laughs) that take the eucalyptus and then hang it upside down in their showers so that when their showers heat heat up or steam up the eucalyptus. Okay, you sold me on a eucalyptus. So next (laughs) year I'll do eucalyptus. Yes, because eucalyptus has so many medicinal properties. And I love that you do saffron. And do you harvest the saffron? I do. I do. Because um, my family's from India. And uh, even though I was born in the US, I grew up for many years, my childhood days, my childhood years, I would say, I grew up in India. So saffron actually is a big part of, you know, uh, the diet over there, whether you have desserts and you use that or, you know, like people talk about the turmeric milk, the golden milk, if you've heard of that, where people put turmeric in milk and warm milk and have it, you know, for it's anti-inflammatory. In India, we not only add turmeric, but we also actually add saffron Mm. in the milk because it has uh, many healing properties and then, you know, some nuts and dry fruits or whatever you like to add. Yes. So I grow saffron and we use it a lot in our cooking in rice, you know, dishes as well. So could I plant saffron bulbs in my garlic bulb grow bag, like next to the garlic? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that this year. I think you should. I want you to. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Done. Wow. You're inspiring me. I love this. Okay, cool. I loved this, like how this episode has divulged into just like girl talk, like gardener's talk <laughs> of just what, what'd you grow? What'd you like? 
but it's helpful. I'm, but I do feel like it's so important for people to take time to reflect because it's an amazing feat. And even at the end of the gardening season, when you might be tired, you have to celebrate, you have to celebrate yourself or just process what worked and what didn't and prep and write it down because you'll forget, write it down because you'll forget. Are you excited about anything? Do you know next year what already what you want to try? Or are you still kind of thinking about that? I think I'm thinking about that a little bit because I usually, you know, I like to dedicate majority of my space because, you know, again, the challenge is space for me. I wish I could try everything. I mean, of course, you know, I still buy the seeds. Don't get me wrong, (laughs) you know, but I have limitation of space. So I like to, you know, grow at least 90% of the things that I know I'm going to love and I want to eat. Smart. So majority would be dedicated to what I know I like is what I'm going to grow. And then I always, and I encourage everyone to always experiment a little bit, try something new. So, you know, grow something that you've never grown before, even if it's say a loofah or a bitter gourd or something like that. Or even if, you know, you don't want to go that far ahead, if it's just a tomato, try a new variety of the food that you, you know, love. That's going a little bit further but so that's the thing. I think maybe I'm going to try and grow cucumelons next year. Let's hope, you fun. know, they look like fun or maybe a loofah or something like that. This year in my garden, something new that I tried was lemongrass, which was amazing. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. it's always, you know, you want to add something new and different because that's the fun of it, discovering what's possible and discovering your new favorite. I know that you are a fan of ground cherries because I've seen them on your Instagram before. I wanted to ask you because I will give you a recommendation because this is probably one of the most favorite plants I've ever grown. I haven't grown it in several years because it's kind of hard to grow in grow bags. But pineapple ground cherries, have you grown the pineapple variety yet? I usually grow Aunt Molly's ground cherries and I love them. I can't have enough. (laughs) Ground cherries are, why is no one talking about ground cherries? Like they're the coolest, most fun thing to grow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's supposed to be in the tomato family, you know, technically speaking, but it's, listen, I would put it in the same category as berries or a fruit, like a blueberry. You can literally put them on your yogurt. Like I put them on my yogurt. (laughs) Exactly. My daughter made a ground cherry jam just a couple of weeks ago. I saw that. It looked amazing. You have to try it. You must. It's so simple. Just like I think three or four ingredients, lemon juice, I think pectin, the ground cherries, and that's it. Just three ingredients or so. So easy. So worth it. Oh my gosh. I mean. Okay. So next year. My new favorite. (laughs) Next year, grow your Aunt Molly's, but grow one pineapple ground cherry pineapple because it's so sweet and tart I bet it would make amazing jam and it's so I mean I would eat them like candy I would put them like berries on top of yogurt or whatever they're so fun and the way that they grow in their little lanterns like they're so cute and prolific and so fun so I encourage everyone to try ground cherries next year because I feel like they're not I feel like gardeners aren't talking about them as much. They're so cool. I agree. And you can't find them in the grocery store because this year I was looking for them because I love the pineapple so much, but I didn't grow it this year and I couldn't find it in any grocery store. So anyway, this conversation has been so lovely. And also I feel lucky to have gotten you before a major thing happening. Your book is coming out next month. Congratulations Yay. as a published author. Welcome to the Authors Club. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I can't tell you. It is a dream come true to be an author, so to speak. I have to pinch myself. I'm so excited. I got the book deal last year. And, you know, a lot of people think that, oh my gosh, it's so hard and overwhelming to write a book. But when you love something, it just, you know, comes naturally, right? And you enjoy the process. And I truly enjoy the process of writing the book. My book is called Vegetable Gardening Made Easy. And if you see my Instagram or any of my social media, I'm all about how can you make gardening simple, fun and easy so it doesn't get overwhelming. And so my book is just full of how to strategies to maximize production from your garden tips and tricks that are so easy to implement. Like the day you get the book, 
you can start implementing these simple techniques in your garden. So not just does it talk about things like putting your garden to bed, but mainly it talks about how to maximize production from your garden, how to even design and plan your garden in the simplest way possible. I have a list of my tried and true favorite varieties, you know, to grow for sure that you'll get good results from. And then it's just about making gardening simple. So it's not overwhelming, but it's fun. And it's something that you want to do because at the end of the day, we want to encourage people to grow their own food, to be in nature and to enjoy the process. You know? Absolutely. So I'm so excited. It comes out December 19th. It's available for pre-order. Pre-orders are important, plant friends. So pre-order. And I think yes. it's the perfect time for a garden. You wouldn't think December is a good, is like an interesting time for a gardening book to come out, but it truly is the perfect time because this is after we put our gardens to bed. We have some free time. Read the book this winter. The book will inspire you. I've I've gotten an advanced copy of it. It's amazing. It is jam-packed. I mean, you waste not one word in that book. It is deliverable after deliverable after deliverable. So, you know, get it and read it this winter in January and February and use it to inform your garden planning for next year. It's awesome. Pre-order. Pre-orders are so important for authors. And yeah, so where can everybody pre-order your book and then where can they find you on social so they can connect and learn from you? Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words about my book. I really appreciate it. Of course, it was wonderful. So you can pre-order the book on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, online, at Target, Walmart, Apple, and bookshop.org. So it's available right now at all these places online to pre-order. And like you said, pre-orders are so important. So, you know, anyone who pre-orders, I really, really, truly appreciate your support. You know, it means the world to me. And apart from that, like you were saying, people can find me on social media, especially on Instagram, at Raish Gala. That's my handle, which is at R-E-S-H-G-A-L-A. And I'm also on YouTube with the same, you know, at Raish Gala. You can find me on Threads. And uh, on my website, which is www.reshgala.com. Perfect. We'll put all those links in the show notes. It's so nice to meet you. And we'll definitely have to compare notes on our garden planning for next year offline as well. Sounds good. And I can't wait to see what you're going to be growing next year and wish you the best with your move. I hope you're going to some days warmer. We'll see. We will see. (laughs) To be continued, (laughs) to be determined. But yes, absolutely. (laughs) Oh, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Rach, for joining us today. She's amazing. We've really hit it off. She's become a plant friend after this conversation. Pre-order her book, Plant Friends. As an author, you know, I got to tell you, those pre-orders matter for your book. So if you liked her, if you feel like you want to learn more from her, like I said, it would be a great kind of inspirational read in the winter for you. Go pre-order her book. We've linked everything in the bio. Go follow her on Instagram. She's such a delight. So thank you again, Raish, for joining us and for being my plant friend. And thank you to all of you plant friends, all of these amazing listeners. You are so incredible. Thank you. Thank you for, if you're new here, thank you for trying the podcast out. I hope you loved it. If you are old here, if you return to this podcast on a weekly basis and show up and are part of this community that is blooming and growing together and growing joy together, I love you and I'm so thankful for you. And I hope this episode was helpful. If you have ideas for 2024 episodes, we're planning all of our content for 2024 right now. You can always email me at maria at growingjoywithmaria.com or you can DM me at growingjoywithmaria on socials or in the Garden Society, our private platform, which you can access at jointhegardensociety.com. So with that, my plant friends, go make your garden beds cozy, make them cozy, cozy them on up, getting ready to go to bed for winter. I hope you get to have a cozy moment with your plants this holiday season as we are entering the holiday seasons. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. 
First, there's the plant parent personality test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free plant parent personality test because plant friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little plant parent personality quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who 
travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 